Okay, so I would like to start today with um, another kind of uh, family member of the Kalman filter and all its friends. Um, we looked so far into the Kalman filter and the extended Kalman filter as two estimation techniques for doing um, recursive Bayesian filtering in the presence of Gaussian distributions and linear or well linearizable models. Um, what we will look into today is the unsended Kalman filter which is um, kind of an extension, you can see that as an extension of the extended Kalman filter um, which is mainly designed for situations where the linearization of the extended Kalman filter, so the Taylor expansion, um, is kind of works suboptimally. So kind of to summarize that, the Kalman filter required exactly linear models. Otherwise, the distribution we obtain would not be a Gaussian distribution anymore after an update step or a measurement step. Therefore, it was essential to have linear function. And the Kalman filter required those linear functions. The problem is that most functions in reality in the real world are nonlinear, and therefore we had to find a solution on how we deal with nonlinear functions. And one way to do that is the extended Kalman filter. And what the extended Kalman filter does, it, it basically takes the um, mean estimate that it currently has from the previous timestamp and linearizes the nonlinear function around that mean and then obtains a linearized function and then kind of applies the Kalman filter to um, update the state. And so the question is, is there actually a better way to do that? So how could you imagine to do that in a smarter way? So what you want to do is you have a Gaussian distribution, you want to squeeze it to some nonlinear function, and then you want to approximate it by a Gaussian again. That's actually what we do. What we do is we have our Gaussian, we linearize our function, we obtain the mapping of that function, and then this is Gaussian again. But there are other ways to do that, and there are better ways to do that if we think about the approximation quality of that Gaussian distribution. The question is, can you imagine a way to do that? It's actually quite intuitive. Let me help you a little bit with the drawing. So we have a Gaussian distribution, which may look like this, drawn in 2D. And we want to squeeze it through some ugly function G, um, which is nonlinear. And then we want to obtain the, uh, our new function, um, which is, of course, not exactly Gaussian, after, it was not a Gaussian anymore after we used this nonlinear function G, but we want to have the best Gaussian approximation of the Gaussian um, transformed through G. What are ways for doing that? So if I tell you nothing about G, I just say, I give you a function that you can evaluate, so you can call G of X, and it gives you the transformed value, how would you realize this uh, this mapping. So how would you obtain this Gaussian distribution? What's an intuitive way for you to do that? Yeah? yeah. So we could generate sample points which we draw according to this Gaussian distribution. So we have our points here. What would you do then? Um, take the function and map it. Yeah, so we propagate all these points through G. So we have our transform points now lying over here. What do we do then? So we now have our transform points. Are we may be not happy because we want to have a Gaussian in the end. Uh, so we try to um, approximate the best Gaussian function. We just compute the mean and the covariance matrix based on the transform points. That's it. And that's very close to what the unsettled Kalman filter does. The problem is you may need a huge number of samples here to do that. And the unsettled transform tells you how to first sample these points in a special way. But you can do that with a quite small number of samples. You can see that also as an approximation of covering the space densely by samples, propagating all those samples, and doing exactly what you have told us. And the uncentered Kalman filter, or uncentered transform, um, which is used in the uncentered Kalman filter, is something 
that does something very similar to that. So that's exactly what you do. We want to use the unsettled transform, which is one way for um, transforming a Gaussian distribution through a nonlinear function and get an as good as possible approximation of the uh, Gaussian approximation of the transformed function. And using this uncentered transform in the Kalman filter for dealing with nonlinear motion and a nonlinear observation model is that what is often referred to as the uncentered Kalman filter. Okay, so as you said before, what the EKF or the Taylor approximation, which is used in the EKF, does, it takes the current mean, so this guy over here, just a single point, the current mean, and use this as the um, linearization point for linearizing the nonlinear function g, and then um, performs, has, has a linearized function g, and then can map this Gaussian um, distribution using the linear function. But the important thing is we kind of just used one single point. And this just one single point is suboptimal if, if we, let's say, have points here in the area of the, let's say, three sigma ellipse, if the function is highly nonlinear in this, in this local region over here, then this is a suboptimal strategy. So what the uncentered transform does, it generates, or well, tells us how to generate so-called sigma points. So this is a deterministic technique to draw them. So given a mean and a covariance, there's a kind of standardized way to do that. So we obtain those samples. And then it does exactly what you told us before. So it uses the nonlinear function and maps those points through the nonlinear function, and then uses these points to reconstruct a Gaussian distribution. There's a little bit more than that, so it does not only use points, it also assigns a weight to each point. So these are weighted points. So every sigma point has a weight, and this weight is simply used in the reconstruction. So to summarize, Everything that the unsuspended transform does, it is first computes the sigma points, then each sigma point also gets a weight, which is computed in a certain way, and then the sigma points are transformed through our nonlinear function, which we don't need to linearize, that's kind of the big advantage in here, and then we kind of estimate again a Gaussian distribution from the transformed points, and that's kind of our approximation of the original Gaussian distribution propagated through the nonlinear function, getting the as good as possible um, Gaussian approximation of this outcome. Of course, if you transform a Gaussian through a nonlinear function, the result will not be Gaussian anymore. But we want to get the best possible Gaussian approximation of that. Of course, if you would leave the Gaussian world, the whole Kalman filter framework would not be applicable anymore. So that is an approximation. So by just taking those points, like we had here on the blackboard, by taking those points, transforming them to G, the points are not Gaussianly distributed anymore. But we are trying to find a good Gaussian approximation for these points. It's important to know that it's, it's, a, it's an approximation that's nothing which is exact. <clears throat> and the, the main advantage is that we don't only use the mean for the linearization, as Taylor expansion or extended common filter does, but we additionally take points into account which are further away from the mean. And this, hopefully, typically does, gives us a better approximation of the uh, function we're going to approximate. So the key question is, how should we choose our um, sigma points and how should we choose our weights? What are our constraints for doing that? If I give you the task of doing this, so you, can, you have to provide me um, a strategy for generating those samples and for coming up with weights. And so one of, one of other kind of the global constraints that we have that we want these points to satisfy. Well, they have to be inside the current the distribution. Yeah, they have to be sampled or drawn, not sampled, because I said we do that in a deterministic way, but we need to have given a mean and a covariance function, actually only a covariance function because the mean should matter, um, everything should be relative to the mean, um, how, how to select those points. That's absolutely right, and they should be, the, the closer they're in there, the, the better it approximates the, let's say, largest amount of the probability mass, because the more we are in the center, the higher the probability mass is there. But what are kind of, from a more general perspective, the, uh, the requirements we have to these sigma points?
So what the easiest function you can imagine for doing such a transformation? What's the most trivial function? For choosing these points. No, not for choosing these points, for the transformation. Identity. The identity. Okay. So let's start with the most simple fact that we have. Yes? So we want points which at least can reconstruct the first Gaussian Exactly. So if we generate those points, then apply the identity, which means do nothing, then we reconstruct the Gaussian distribution, we want to come up with the same mean and the same covariance. If this is not given, it's likely to, to be flawed. Okay. And this gives us the first constraints that we want to have. So we want to choose those sigma points, xi, so these are the individual sigma points, and we choose a certain amount and wait for the sigma points so that the weights sum up to 1 and that if we reconstruct the mean from these weighted uh, points, we should come we could obtain the original mean that we had and the same for the covariance matrix. So if we reconstruct um, from these sample points a covariance matrix, it should give us exactly the covariance matrix we had before. If this wouldn't be the case and you would apply the uncentered transform to identity, um, your system would diverge without doing anything. So this is kind of a requirement that we have. Right? This is clear to everyone. Okay, perfect. The only thing which we need to mention is that there's no unique solution to that, to the how to select the sigma points and the weights. So there are several ways for doing this so that they all fulfill this constraint. This is nothing which is dramatically bad for us. The only thing um, which should be noted is there's kind of a space of solutions to do that. So there's no one single best strategy on how to select the weights and how to select the, the sigma points, but there's one way which I will show today, and you typically have some free parameters in there like how to set the weights given a certain subspace. And you can then tweak those parameters um, if you have certain background knowledge about your function. So if you want to cover some, for example, higher order moments, so a typical distrib Gaussian distribution has two moments, the mean is, a, is one moment and the um, covariance matrix is another moment, and there are additional moments which are all zero for the Gaussian distribution. If we have some additional knowledge, we may optimize those parameters to take into account some background knowledge. But if we don't know anything, um, we don't really need to care about those parameters. That will, in the end, provide one way on how to select them. If they are several parameters, how do they depend on each other, and what does it kind of mean if you set a certain parameter, but you have the freedom of selecting parameters. Okay. So <clears throat> the question is, how do we choose the sigma points? And I will now tell you how to do that and also kind of provide you with an intuitive, or at least give you an intuitive ex explanation why this may make sense. So the first sigma point we choose, it's our mean. Of course, the mean is kind of the, 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 the best thing we did before. The Taylor approximation linearized around the mean, so the mean is in there. And the centered sigma points, um, the number of sigma points you choose depends on the dimensionality of your, um, of your distribution. And for every dimension you have, you choose two additional sigma points. So if you have a one-dimensional Gaussian, you would choose three sigma points, the mean and two times one dimension. If you have a two-dimensional um, Gaussian, you would choose five sigma points, the mean plus two times two. And they are chosen in a way that you have, so they are, they are parameterized relative to the mean. So you, the first thing is you start with the mean. And the second thing you have the mean plus some term and the mean minus some term. So you will have, if you have a mean, you have something in the x direction, plus and minus in the x direction. So they're kind of centered around the mean in the individual dimensions. That also makes sense. If you want to reconstruct um, the mean from that, you have always two points which can cancel out each other if they are transformed through the identity and then you will end up with your mean point in the end, which makes sense. Okay, so how are they chosen? So um, this term over here with this index i here is a column vector of a matrix. So the guy in there is a matrix, the, the, the two expression in brackets, and this is kind of the i's column vector of this, uh, of this matrix. And it's a square root of something. And this something consists of three terms. The, f the term n is the dimensionality of our problem. So do we have a one-dimensional Gaussian distribution, a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution, and so on. 
And the term lambda here is a scaling parameter. That's one of those parameters which I can set. And this kind of tells me how far do I want to move away from the mean along a certain direction. The bigger this lambda values, the further I will move away from the mean. The um, smaller this value is, the closer I will, I will go, come to the mean. And then there is um, the um, covariance matrix here. It's actually this, the matrix square root of the covariance matrix. So what is the matrix square root? Um, the matrix square root, there are actually several ways for defining it. Um, so if you want to compute the square root of sigma, and you can write sigma as uh, two matrix S times S, then S is the square root of this matrix. You sometimes find a different definition. You can actually use both of them. It's kind of it's S, S transposed. And then one of them is matrix square root. The reason why we choose this is this has some numerical advantages and is strongly related to the Cholesky decomposition that you may know from linear algebra. So how do we compute that? It's kind of the first um, question that we might have. How do we actually obtain this matrix over here? We can do that um, actually in quite intuitive way. So <coughs> as our um, matrix, sigma is a covariance matrix. It's positive semi-definite. It contains real numbers and every um, symmetric matrix with um, real elements is diagonalizable. That means we can rewrite our matrix sigma as a product of a matrix V times matrix D, and this matrix D has diagonal form, so only elements on the main diagonal, um, times um, V to the power of minus one. So it actually kind of looks like this over here, this expression over here. This is something we can do, um, we can diagonalize this expression. And um, so who of you know something about eigenvectors and eigenvalues? Has heard that, okay, that's good. At least some of you. Um, that's actually pretty related to um, setting up eigenvectors and eigenvalues because those elements along the main diagonal here are actually eigenvalues of this, um, of this matrix here. So if we think about, just an expression for those of you who may not know what an eigenvalue or eigenvector is, for the, if we look to a Gaussian distribution, let's we go to 2D, and we have here our, um, our ellipse. Um, the eigenvectors are the vectors which go along the main diagonal. So this is the, the first uh, main axis of the uh, ellipse, and this is the second main axis of the ellipse. So these are kind of two eigenvectors, the two eigenvectors of this 2D Gaussian, and to every eigenvector we have an eigenvalue associated, and the, the ratio of the eigenvalues tells me how much bigger, um, so kind of what's the scaling between this axis and this axis. So if the both eigenvalues are the same value, we have a circle. There's then, in this case, kind of the ratio between this length and this length is one. And if this one is kind of twice as big, I would have an eigenvalue which is twice as big as the other eigenvalue. This kind of, kind of gives you an intuitive explanation how this looks in the Gaussian framework. And you may agree that may also make sense that you may choose your sigma points, for example, on these main axes. It's actually one way to do that. So you, you cover the um, both uh, parts of that Gaussian um, as good as you can. Okay. Okay, we were at the point where we wanted to compute the, um, the matrix square root. And what we know is that we can write our matrix, our covariance matrix, in the form V D V to the power of minus one. And D contains um, only elements on the main diagonal. So I can rewrite that. Okay, we'll use 
the last term over here on that slide, I can keep v and v to the power of minus 1 and rewrite this matrix D in the middle as a product of two matrices where on the main diagonal there are the square roots of the individual values. Because if I multiply those two these two matrices, I will exactly get this matrix. And this works because there are just elements in the main diagonal. Therefore, I can do that that easily. Otherwise, I couldn't do that. OK. And then I can define, say, I tell you that the matrix square root of this guy is V D half, which is D half should, or should actually correspond to this matrix over here. Let's call this D to the, or D prime, whatever you want. Just to not confuse it with the square root itself, perhaps it's better. Or it's called d bar, doesn't matter. And then v to the power of minus 1. And this is the matrix square root. You can actually see why. If you have s times uh, s times s, then you would end up with v d bar v to the power of minus 1 times, so this is what's s, second s, v d bar v to the power of minus 1, v times uh, v to the power of minus 1 times v, this gives identity. So this here gives an identity. So we have v d bar d bar v to the power of minus 1. And this exactly equals d. So this is v d v to the power of minus 1. And this is exactly our um, covariance matrix. So if we use any algorithm we have for computing for computing this diagonalization, then we take the diagonal matrix here, the square root of the individual elements, and we have our matrix. So one way to do that, there, okay, so the derivation is also here for you on the, on the slide, so you don't have to copy it from the blackboard. Um, there's no further information than what I've written down here exactly. And there's an alternative way to do that, and this is um, sometimes called the Cholesky matrix square root. Um, there, the difference is that you don't require LL or SS here, but LL transposed. It works exactly in the same way because um, the, this, these matrix here have exactly the same eigenvectors as um, our matrix down here. So you actually move along the, uh, the same eigenvectors if, in the end if you do that. Um, the result why people use this is because it's actually numerically more, uh, more stable to use this solution. And therefore, in most practical implementations of the UKF, you actually find people using the Cholesky factorization uh, to, 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 com to compute LL transposed, which is the result of um, Cholesky. And then L gives you exactly this matrix, which you use as the matrix square root. So whenever you implement that, um, that's the way to go. So we know how actually now to compute this guy over here, and then we may obtain our, uh, our sigma points. So this is an example for those sigma points. So the um, red ellipse is our original covariance matrix sigma, and then we have sigma squared, which is the um, green curve over here, and then these are the sigma points we have chosen. You can see here, that in this case, so the sigma points do not necessarily have to be aligned with the main axis. This can be the case, but um, so in this case, it's actually not at all the case. But um, the, so it doesn't have to be the case that they, are, that they are aligned with the main axis. But depending on the property of the matrix that you have, um, this can be the case. But you will always find the pattern that you have. This is the mean. You have something, a vector in plus and minus direction for every dimension. OK, so let's look to the weights that we are going to obtain. This is a way to set the weights. And if you do it in this way, it actually, um, the property that we defined in the beginning that we want to be able to recover, uh, recover our mean and covariance is given. But again, there are three parameters in there which you can choose. And this is again our scaling parameter that we had before. And um, the dimensionality n. And we have actually two different weight values here. We have one, for the, one weight for the mean for the zeros um, sigma point, which was the mean. 
and also for reconstructing the covariance. So the M here always is exactly for, for the mean and the C is for the, for the covariance matrix. Um, so the zeros, I, uh, the zero sigma point has a special weight and all the weights for all others are the same and are given by this equation over here. Again, alpha and beta are different parameters. The reason why they are given this suboptimal way, you could say, I've just replaced this by one term. Yes, you could do that, but um, the, I don't want to go into the details why they aren't providing that way. That's a standard way to do that because it allows you, if you have additional information about the about your, your nonlinear function that you may want to cover some of the higher order moments, you can actually do this with these alpha and beta terms. So they are, there's kind of a reason why they are given in this way, not this guy here, for example, is given by w just one parameter, but are two parameters. Okay, exactly. And these are, so we have now three, three parameters that we can choose. This is the reason for this, why, we, why there are, is, is more than one parameter set, because there's no unique solution to that problem of um, how to set the weights and the sigma points in order to recover the Gaussian moments of so the mean and the covariance matrix. <coughs> okay, so how do we, so we have now our points, so we can map our points through our nonlinear function. G, and then we, are, we should be able to recover our transformed mean and our transformed covariance matrix. And this is done exactly in the way you would assume this happens. So you have your 2n plus 1 sigma points. You sum over them the weight of that sigma point times G of that sigma point. So you map your individual sigma point through a nonlinear function G, multiply it with the weight and sum of all of them. And you do that for the mean and for the covariance uh, matrix in exactly the same way. And then we have the so, um, mu prime and sigma prime are now the parameters of the Gaussian approximation of the transferred Gaussian according to the uncentered transform. Okay, this is an example how that look li looks like. So you know these plots from the EKF. Down here we have our Gaussian distribution which was our input distribution. <clears throat> this is our nonlinear function. So um, we, we compute our sigma points. So this kind of, so we propagate our sigma points through this function and then um, compute the, um, recover the parameters of the transformed Gaussian exactly as we, we, we discussed before. What you see here is, so this term over here gives you what the exact distribution would look like. We had that before. So if I really transform this Gaussian through this nonlinear function, that's actually the function I, I, will, I will obtain. But again, we said we want to have the, Gauss, the, best, or the best possible Gaussian approximation of that. And um, so what you actually obtain is this dashed line over here. It's kind of the function that we obtain through this um, uncentered transform. The real mean and the real covariance that you would compute from this distribution is actually the, the, um, the non-dashed line. So it is different, but they're actually not too far away from each other. And this actually, this approximation is better than the approximation that the EKF would give you. But again, it is an approximation. So just two more examples. <clears throat> so this was our initial um, distribution. So we compute our sigma points. These are our sigma points here. Then we transform the sigma points. So the function here is a linear function. Just uh, shift um, by uh, one in x and one in y. We shift our points here, then recover our Gaussian distribution, and then we obtain the black result. So this is exactly the same what the, uh, this example on the left, on the left hand side here, what the, <coughs> sorry, what the, um, the linearization would give us because this function is already linear. So it's kind of, then nothing is lost in this case. Or if we take whatever, any random nonlinear function, then these sigma points are kind of mapped here. And then this is a function that we are going to recover from that. And in this case, um, the result we obtain is typically substantially better than what the linearization would actually give us. Kind of depends how different or how much does the, the nonlinear function um, is away from linear approximation in the area in which you select the sigma points. The sigma points are selected according to the parameters that, that we set. So 
if they are all go very, very close to the mean, it will be very similar to the linearization, to what the linearized function would do. If they go further away, then you're better. If you're too far away, um, then it can actually get worse again because you're kind of away from the, in the you're not anymore in the kind of meaningful area of your, of your distribution. Okay, just to summarize this, this is everything which is here was, was on, the, on these slides before. This was how to select the sigma points. This is a strategy for how to select the weights. And then we are ready to go. And now just one single slide on how to select the parameters. So this is a parameter suggestion which comes, or not suggestion, the, the parameters according to the scaled uncentered transform. The scaled uncentered transform is a generalization of the uncentered transform which has some nice, nice properties. And I use the parameterization here as it is also used for the, um, in the scaled uncentered transform. So you, the alpha value that we've seen before is a value between zero and one. So it can, can take one but shouldn't take uh, zero. So between the open interval here, between zero and one. If we have Gaussians, Gaussian distributions that we put in, the beta equals two is, is what, we are going, what we are going to have. If our function has other properties, uh, the, 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 it leads, no, sorry, the transformation leads to higher order moments, this parameter B so may not be two, you can adjust that to, to other values. But I don't want to go into the details on how to kind of tweak the parameters because actually it's also not too trivial and I also don't have that much experience with tweaking those parameters. And then we have our, our term lambda. The lambda again depends on this value alpha, it depends on n and the value kappa. You can choose any value bigger or equal to zero. N is a dimensionality. So it's kind of a strategy with which you can set all your parameters that you need to set and then you can apply the unsetted transform. Now just some examples to give you a little bit of an intuition what happens if you change these, these individual parameters. So if we, on this slide I set um, kappa to 3 and just vary the um, value for alpha. So if alpha is very small, all those points are in this plot indistinguishable or nearly indistinguishable from the mean. So the smaller lam uh, alpha gets, the closer those points move towards the mean. And the larger lambda gets, the further those points move away from the mean. So you see this one, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 0 0.25, 0 0.75. So they move outside. Okay. We can also, and a similar effect is given if we kind of fix um, alpha and simply vary the value of kappa. So they actually both work in a similar way. The higher kappa get, the more those points actually move to the outside or even far outside your, the two sigma bounds which are actually plotted here. But again, these are free parameters and you can choose, some of the parameters you can choose freely, you will get, get the same results and some parameters you can optimize if you have some background knowledge about the function that does the mapping with function g. But that's kind of, don't want to go into the details of setting these parameters. Okay, so what we've seen so far is the uncentered transform. It's just kind of, this is the basic that we need in order to derive the uncentered Kalman filter. And what I would like to do now is to use the um, extended Kalman filter algorithm that we had before and, and kind of change it so that we end up with the extended Kalman filter. So as a reminder, that's what uh, our extended Kalman filter looks like. I hope you still remember that. And what I want to do now is kind of change this algorithm so that we end up with the unsetted Kalman filter. And we'll start with the prediction step, modifying the prediction step in order to um, have not use the Taylor uh, approximation or linearization by the Taylor expansion, but the uncentered transform in order to come up with um, uh, with using the answer to transform to compute the predicted mean and the predicted uh, variance. So we try to fix this, kind of get rid of the extended Kalman filter, go to the uh, unsented Kalman filter, and the first thing we now need to do is actually replace those two lines, line two and line three of the extended Kalman filter with the line that we need for the extended Kalman filter. And I would like you to do that now, together with me on the blackboard, so what do we need to do in order to realize those two steps? Yeah. 
you can cheat if you look up the slides on the web, but you can also use your brain to do that. <laughs> So first, we need to define our sigma points, kind of the first step that we're going to do. So we say we have our mean at t minus 1, and then our mean at t minus 1 minus some, whatever, gamma times the square root of t minus minus 1, sorry, plus minus 1, and the same, or let's say, plus minus. Then we have our sigma points. What do we need to do is that next? Is there a nonlinear function of these points? Mm -hmm. So we let's say take y t is a set of points where every individual point. Oh, we can actually do that directly. The mean uh, save save a little bit of space. So we want to compute then directly the mean t, the predicted mean, this guy over here given by the sum from i equals 0 to 2n and exactly summing over the weighted transform points. So our weights and um, g x i. It's written like this. And then we have our transformed um, mean. What do we do with the um, with the uh, covariance matrix? Exactly. So, what, what do we need to do here? How do we compute the covariance matrix? n from 0 to 2n. Okay, well, wait. How are we going to do that? Yeah. The point <coughs> x uh, i minus the mean. Um, it's a transform point. Ah, the transform point. Sorry. All right, yeah, exactly. Minus the mean, the predicted mean. Times that, yeah, times that transpose. Yeah. Um, transpose. Am I done? So that's what the uncentered transform tells us. We're done with the uncentered transform, but there's something missing in the Kalman filter step. If we execute a prediction step, we increase our uncertainty. In which way do we increase our uncertainty? Or why do we increase our uncertainty? Plus, some error. Yeah. Plus our RT, which was the motion noise. Because we expand our, um, the covariance matrix by this term. Uh, because we start from 0, i equals 0, uh, to, okay. to 2n, and then you have n, 2n plus 1. But we take into account all sigma points. Yeah. And that's exactly um, what we've written down here. The only difference is these points have been trans transformed. So we kind of move this guy into uh, directly in here. But of course, if you would implement that, you wouldn't execute the three times the transformation. You just would pre-compute it once and then do that. That's exactly the, pre the prediction step of the extended, um, of the unsetted common filter. Okay, then the next is use the sigma point, uh, the unsetted transforms, which has the idea of using sigma points and um, the, the weights to do the same thing for the observation and to compute uh, the Kalman gain. You can do that exactly in the same way or at least the beginning can be done exactly the same way. So what do we need to do? Just don't write it down, but at least I want to hear it again. So we had our, um, so we have to, again, generate new sigma points based on our um, 
predicted belief. And we need to do that because we need to um, approximate the nonlinear observation model, which maps from the um, state x to the space of observations. So what we do is we compute new sigma points for the predicted belief and use these sigma points to uh, transform it with the function h, not with the function g. The function h maps into the space of observations. So we obtain kind of points in the, obs in the space of observations and then um, recover the uncertainty and um, the mean for this transformed observation. Then we compute the Kalman gain based on that and we continue exactly in the way we would do it with the extended Kalman filter. If you write that down in an algorithmic way, you again generate your set of sigma points now from the predicted belief at time t, so the best thing we have right now, the prediction. And then we compute these transform points by taking the predicted, uh, the predicted, the points from the predicted belief, the sigma points propagated through H, and then compute a predicted observation, that's kind of the, the, the mean of the observation, and the associated uncertainty that we are going to expect. And this, again, is the uncertainty that we had here from uh, the uncertainty transform plus the uncertainty that we have in our observations. The only thing which now it's slightly changed is how we compute the Kalman gain. It's actually not different. It's exactly the same what the EKF does, but the formula looks a little bit different. And the reason for this is that this term S that we compute here from these points was not directly a matrix we had in the EKF. It was the part which consists of the, um, the Jacobian of H times the um, uncertainty, the predicted uncertainty times the Jacobian transpose, but we don't have that Jacobian anymore. So we don't have this Jacobian H because um, we don't want to linearize this function. Therefore, this looks a little bit different. But you can actually show that it's, it turns out to be exactly the same, um, just using the, the uncentered transform. So this, this matrix S corresponds, so this is the line coming from the, from the Kalman filter equation, is this term over here. And so this term over here, this H, sigma bar um, H transposed plus QT is exactly what this expression gives us. So this turns into this term, this is ST, and we can, by relating the, the, the state and the observations, um, we exactly obtain this term over here. So this, this term is computed according to this. This guy, the second part is this S, and then the Kalman gain is simply given by this matrix times this matrix in inverted. And we end up exactly with the same term that we have here. So the, the matrices which are written down are kind of have different, different name, but in the end um, we obtained exactly the same thing. So then we have the Kalman gain and then we can continue. Um, once we have the Kalman gain, we compute the mean exactly in the same way. We compute the covariance again not exactly in the same way, just because everything is done now with this, with this matrix S. So if we take this line over here and compare it to what the EKF does, um, this was the line which was in the EKF, which contained the, um, the Kalman gain and again the um, Jacobian of the measurement function. And then we can do some derivations, end up exactly in what is written here. If you don't believe that, this kind of in, in big that you can also in the last line see it in those guys watching it at home by the video. Um, so we have, so this is a line which we have in the um, extended Kalman filter. This was kind of how to compute the final um, covariance matrix. So if we multiply that in, so we have this identity is replaced by the um, predicted uh, uncertainty and we have the term here, then these two terms exactly give me this matrix of the cross correlations between x and that. Um, then I can add in here s to the power of minus 1 times s, so this is the identity matrix. I can just multiply that in here. Um, what's done next? This guy over here is exactly the Kalman gain according to the definition we had before in the slide, so we end up with the Kalman gain. And then we get rid of the transpose, which is here in the brackets, obtain this equation, and then we are there. So that's kind of 
This is just a different way for writing that because we don't have this h, we have only what we compute is only h times sigma bar, and therefore we uh, this exactly we, we end up with this solution because all the terms have been computed already. But there's kind of there's no black magic behind this behind this, this calculation. It's just a different way of writing it because we have, we, we have other variables computed on the way towards the solution, and we just use these other matrices to do exactly the same calculations. Okay, if we compare the result of the um, <coughs> um, uncentered Kalman filter with the um, with the extended Kalman filter, again this is our nonlinear function. This is our input Gaussian distribution. We map it through this nonlinear function, and what you see here on the left is the result of the EKF, and that's the result of the UKF. Again, this function is exactly the same. The true mean and the true Gaussian, these are kind of the non-dash lines, are exactly the same. Um, because this, this is just a property of the nonlinear function, not of the UKF or EKF realization. But the dashed lines are the outputs of the um, UKF versus the um, EKF. You can see here that the, the, the predicted mean, the mean of the EKF is further away from the true mean compared to the UKF. And this dashed line is also closer to this distribution compared to this dashed line over here, which is the transformed Gaussian. So the, the transformation of the Gaussian under in the EKF is worse from the approximation than what the UKF does. If we again show this with a smaller covariance, we, so we had the effect, if you remember that, if the the, the, the variance in the input Gauss in the input distribution is smaller. The effect of the linearization is typically uh, not as bad because the, po the, the the probability mass is closer to the linearization point in the EKF. And then you can also see this effect that this is again the EKF, which is much closer to the re to the true distribution. But again, the UKF does a little bit better in this case. I mean, I'm not sure if you see that in the back, but um, from the back. But this is kind of a little bit closer than what the EKF estimates. So um, again, there's an advantage of using the UKF because depending on the nonlinear function. So the more nonlinear your function is, or the, the, the worth the approximation through a single linearization is for, the, um, for, for your model, the better the UKF will perform compared to the EKF. And just one example where you can see a difference for, um, for the motion of the mobile robot. If you look to the banana-shaped distribution that you obtain if you propagate your motion according to the standard odometry of velocity-based motion model, you kind of get this banana-shaped distribution. That's what the real distribution looks like. If you do the EKF approximation of that, that's actually what you're going to obtain. So what you see here, there are areas which have significant, significant probability mass which are not covered or badly covered not badly covered by, the, by this approximation. If you compare that to the UKF approximation, you can see that the uncertainty is bigger in, uh, in, this, dim in this dimension over here. Um, this covers this better than the EKF. This, kind of, this is one of the typical situations that you see if you use the EKF versus the UKF for modeling the motion of a mobile robot. Of course, the more noisy the motion of the robot is, especially in the, in the heading, the more, uh, the bigger the difference. If it has a very low error in the heading, um, this effect is probably ne neglectable. And this is just one example I took from, from a book. Um, <coughs> so just again a comparison between what the UKF does and what the EKF does. So this is my original Gaussian distribution. I can sample a lot of points according to the Gaussian distribution. It's kind of covering very, very densely with samples. I have some nonlinear function f, I map all those points, and kind of the, then the, the points are kind of uh, distributed according to this function over here, and this is kind of the true mean and the true covariance which are computed from whatever thousands of points. So it's not ground truth, but it's close as possible to ground truth. Uh, not as close as possible, you could take more points, you're closer, but what's something, just regard this ground truth here. If you would perform the EKF, and so you just Compute the, for the mean, you linearize the function and then propagate all points through this function, you would actually end up with this um, pink uh, covariance 
uh, ellipse, uncertainty ellipse and mean over here. And you can here see that it's actually a substantial difference to what the true distribution actually looks like. If you use the EKF, so sampled kind of four sigma points over here, transform those sigma points, then you actually get the green Gaussian estimate over here. Again, it is not the true estimate, but it's closer to the true estimate uh, just by visual inspection compared to the result that the EKF actually provides. So if you have highly nonlinear functions, the UKF can be a very interesting alternative to the EKF because it has better mean for, um, uh, for, computing, for, for, for computing the Gaussian approximation um, of the Gaussian propagated through a nonlinear function. So, so summarize this a little bit up. So the uncertainty transform is just an alternative to the linearization and it's typically better than the uh, Taylor expansion, what, so what the EKF does. And, um, and kind of the, the advantages of the, of the uncertainty transform is for highly nonlinear functions. <coughs> so instead of having one linearization point, which is the mean, the uncertainty transform adds additional points. So kind of the, uh, the, the sigma point number zero is or is the mean, and then it adds additional points to that and propagates the uh, these points through the nonlinear function and obtains a Gaussian estimate. There are three parameters in the uncentered transform and because there's no unique solution for how to set the weights and how to set the um, sigma points. And we can use the uncentered transform in the prediction step and in the correction step of the EKF and then we obtain something which is typically called the uncentered Kalman filter, um, UKF. If we compare the results um, of the UKF and the EKF, they give you the same results for linear models. There may be numerical issues, so you're not free of numerical issues always, but um, if you have high pre precision in what you can compute, they, you should get the same result if you run the EKF and the UKF for linear models. So for linear models, we should get the same um, results. <coughs> for nonlinear models, the UKF is, to, is a better approximation than the EKF. However, most people say with reasonably engineered robots, that means that the uncertainty is not extremely large in the motion, it's not extremely large in the observation, this difference is somewhat small. So you can see this, but it really depends on your application. So if you have a really, really crappy uh, motion system of a robot, it may be worse to, to use the unscented um, Kalman filter, but if you have a decently designed system, the, the difference to the EKF is really small. Um, one advantage of the UKF, except that it's, uh, is that you don't need to compute the Jacobians. If you're kind of a little bit lazy, you don't want to compute the Jacobians or it's additional source of error, um, you can skip that with the UKF. Um, they're in the same complexity class, but the UKF is typically a little bit slower than the EKF if, if you really do an implementation because you need to transform all those points. So in practice, UKF is a little bit slower, but the same uh, same complexity class. But again, we are still restricted to Gaussian distributions. The only thing that we do, we kind of get a better approximation of the underlying distribution through a Gaussian if we use the uncentered transform except uh, compared to the, um, the Taylor expansion for the linearization. If you want to know more about that, there's chapter 3.4 in the probabilistic robotics book, which um, is something which follows directly after the EKF in the book, which as it was done here, explains what we have done here. The notations would be very similar to what I have shown here. Um, there are two other books or two other articles, not books, articles, which I um, found um, nice. It's kind of the new extension of the Kalman filter to nonlinear system that by Julia and Ullmann. And Julia is actually one of the guys behind the EKF. It's also a technique which is I'll say, reasonably new, so it's less than 20 years old. Um, compared to the Kalman filter, which dates back into the 50s. And there's also, um, I think it's a script uh, of another lecture on Dynamische Zustandsschätzung. Um, you find it on the web um, in the four pages. It's in German, but for those of you who may prefer German literature, I found it actually worth reading. It was kind of well um, readable as well. Okay, so that's it from my side for the UKF. And we will um, now look into... <coughs> 